Our next speaker is Tom Su, who is Associate Professor at the University of Delaware. And uh, his title is Understanding Wave-Driven Fine Sediment Transport Through 3D Turbulence and Resolving Simulations, Implications for to Offshore Delivery of Fine Sediment. Tom, thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation, and I've been enjoying the meeting the past few days. Uh, so today I'd like to uh, uh, discuss a, a few of the uh, numerical investigation that I've been involved in the past few years. And the goal is to, sorry, the goal is, try to, is trying to understand fine sediment transport in the wave bottom boundary layer. And as I will mention later, uh, this is actually a very important process in terms of uh, trying to understand the, the offshore delivery of, of, of fine sediment uh, in the coastal ocean. I'd like to first uh, acknowledge my co-author, uh, my current graduate student, um, Charlie and Posta Yu Xiao, and my former graduate student, Amory Ozdemir, and Dr. Ba Chenda from U Florida have provided us with the original version of the code, and also have provided a lot of important insight in the fluid mechanics aspect of this problem. And also, uh, funding is supported by NSF and ONR. And I also want to mention that our work has been inspired by many collaborators working on the similar subject, but they were mainly focused on laboratory and the field observation. But those are really the motivation uh, of our study. So first, uh, turns out a uh, wave boundary layer is a very important conduit delivering I would say it's one of the important conduit delivering fine sediment offshore. And, um, and therefore, it is, this is an important uh, problem to be studied because it is important to uh, our understanding of offshore delivery of sediment in sediment source to sink. And this is achieved by the one, this process called wave-supported gravity-driven mud flow. And so I will elaborate a little bit more uh, using this Eel River as an example. So uh, during the river flooding event, turns out the Eel River plume actually just go all the way north and attach to the coast. And therefore, the initially deposited sediment is also very close to the shore. However, researchers have found that uh, the, most of the more long-term deposit of those fine sediment is actually located much more offshore in about 60 to 90 meter water depths. So it becomes a puzzle how this large amount of offshore cross-shell delivery of fine sediment can occur. And, uh, and by more detailed uh, field observation by, in this case, by uh, Tchaikovsky, he shows that it turns out uh, during the large wave event, a lot of sediment is actually suspended uh, in, in pretty high concentration uh, in the wave boundary layer. And, and, and then uh, they were then delivered uh, by the offshore directed gravity flow. And uh, so the, the, but the important thing, or I should say a little bit counterintuition here is that those are very fine sediments with a settling velocity only on the order of one millimeter per second. So you, you would expect that those sediments in this kind of a typical wave current bottom boundary layer condition, they should be pretty much suspended and well mixed, more well mixed in the entire water column. But in fact, what you see here is that they are mostly confined in the wave boundary layer. And it turns out what he was trying to argue here is that it turns out the suspended sediment actually can actively dampen the turbulence. So in this case, what you see here is a very sharp negative sediment concentration gradient located near the top of the wave boundary layer. And this is the so-called Luto climb. And, and the, the existence of local kind actually effectively confine the fine sediment within the thin wave boundary layer, and then you can accumulate enough buoyancy anomaly and drive the sediment offshore. And so, so this is sort of the process that's sort of driving the offshore delivery of fine sediment, but as you can see, it's all within the wave boundary layer. But an important thing here to be noted is that the wave boundary layer thickness is only on the order of 10 centimeters. So it's a very thin layer near the bed. And if we want to model sediment source to sink, and may, we may want to use uh, some coastal modeling systems such as RUMS. And, uh, and, and Corey Harris is going to have a clinic about RUMS this afternoon. But, but the important thing to be noted here is that in this kind of uh, uh, coastal modeling system, you are not able to resolve the process very close to the bed. Okay, so in other words, 
this wave supported gravity flow or the associated wave boundary layer processes has to be parameterized. So therefore, if you go back to the literature, you see people like Don Wright, Carl Friedrichs, and Malcolm Scully, they have provided this kind of uh, Richardson number control type of concept, trying to estimate the total amount of a suspended low uh, in this problem. And then uh, later, uh, Corney Harris has proposed uh, and his, her colleague has proposed a more complicated uh, formulation. They call it a near-bad turbulator formulation, which more sort of explicitly incorporate bottom erosion, deposition, entrainment, and wave bottom boundary layer processes. So that he, she will couple this into, in this case, will be ECOM set, and then show that the model is able to predict the offshore off delivery of fine set. Uh, but then if, if the goal is to predict the total transport rate, uh, not only you need to estimate the sediment load, you also need to estimate the flow velocity that delivers the sediment. So to estimate the velocity, we typically require a parameterization on the bottom drag coefficient. And this leads me to the, 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 the next motivation here. Turns out the suspended sediment can also actively changing the bottom drag coefficient experienced by the tidal current or the wave. Uh, using this uh, Amazon as an example, researcher has found that when the tidal current is propagating over a thick layer of mud, turns out the tidal current experiences so-called a drag reduction, a reduction of drag coefficient. And this is attributed to the observed lutocline climb, again, because luto climbs damps the uh, sediment damps the turbulence and causing the drag reduction. However, more interesting thing is that if you look at the literature about wave, a lot of people actually reported that when wave propagates over a thick layer of mud, wave actually often experience large wave energy dissipation. Okay? And uh, so here I'm showing you a data provided by Alex Sherman from U Florida. What you see here is a, a, a time series. Uh, the color represents sediment concentration, but I look at this as a time series of the state of the seabed of a mud. Uh, during the passage of a storm, okay? And this is uh, located, I think, in the inner shelf of uh, Chavalaya. And what, what you see here first is that you see a diverse range of seabed state from the more well-mixed condition to the formation of a lutocline. climb. But more interesting thing here is that if you look at the wave dissipation rate, it is really becoming very large only during the waning stage of the storm. And, and if you look at the bottom, it seems to be associated with a sudden contraction of the mud layer. And uh, more data provided by Peter Tchaikovsky in the same place, he sh he's able to show that in this condition, turns out the wave boundary layer is not even turbulent. Okay, you don't have a minus five-third slope here. So it's pretty much a lamorized wave boundary layer. So it seems that the large surface wave dissipation rate uh, is associated with the sudden lamorization of or non-turbulent type of uh, bottom wave boundary layer. So our goal here is trying to understand through numerical simulation how the suspended sediment can modulate turbulence and causes transition of this different diverse seabed state. So because the goal is trying to understand how sediment uh, changing the turbulence, so in the beginning we decided that we want to use a turbulence resolving approach instead of the Reynolds average approach because we believe that we are able to resolve the turbulence sediment interaction better this way. And also we're going to look at sediment, fine sediment. So the sediment velocity is in the range of 0.1 to 1 millimeter per second. So therefore we will ignore the inertia effect of the particles and therefore, we will use the something called equilibrium approximation where we can approximate the particle sediment velocity as uh, local fluid velocity plus settling velocity plus some high order uh, terms associated with Stokes number. But in this study, I'm just going to also ignore the high order terms. And then if you substitute this relationship into the standard two-phase equation for fluid and the sediment, and then making the Boussinic approximation, you end up have this simplified governing equation in which you look at how sediment changing the turbulence simply through a stratified flow analogy. So that's why you see this term is associated with the Richardson number, which I'm going to come back 
to talk about it more later. And then you see that the sediment is just updated by a standard mass conservation. And we're solving this 3D equation with the high accuracy pseudo spectrum scheme previously used for the numerical simulation for turbulent flow. And, um, and now I think it's very good to uh, summarize some of the non-dimensional parameters controlling this problem based on the governing equation that I've shown. So first is the Reynolds number. The Reynolds number really controls the wave intensity in the wave boundary layer. And if you go back to look at the ear shelf where people see wave-supported gravity flow, uh, the most energetic condition is, is about wave velocity amplitude 0.55 meters per second, wave period is about 10 seconds. So if you look at the Reynolds number, it's, on, it's only uh, below 1,000. This suggests two things. First of all, Reynolds number 1,000 is only in the intermittently turbulent condition. So the, f the wave boundary layer, even without sediment, is not fully turbulent, okay? And also, because the Reynolds number is relatively low, so we are actually able to resolve all the scale of turbulence all the way to the chromograph scale in this specific case uh, with about uh, 10 million grid point. And, uh, and the second thing is that if you look at the non-dimensional settling velocity, uh, which definitely controls the problem, uh, what I'm going to show you again is we're only going to look at typical fine sediment in the range of 0.1 to 1.5 millimeter per second. And I also want to mention that we do not explicitly incorporate flocculation dynamics. We're just going to try a range of a different settling velocity and see how the result is different. And, and finally, the problem must also be controlled by the sediment availability. And in the older version of the model, in the, uh, a few years ago, we started by prescribe the sediment concentration in the water column in, through the initial condition. And then in the meantime, we do not allow sediment to get eroded or leave the domain. So in other words, throughout the entire simulation, the sediment availability is prescribed and is fixed. And the only reason we do this is because it's just easier to implement numerically. And also, my student will tell you that, well, this is a more similar to the river flooding condition in which the sediment input is really not controlled by the bottom suspension, but it's more controlled by the river input. But in any case, and so in this case, we can really quantify the problem by a fixed Bach Richardson number that essentially controls the total amount of sediment in your domain. But we have to admit that in more common situation, wave, uh, sediment is resuspended and can be deposited to the bed. And so in this case, we really need an erosional depositional boundary condition, and then the sediment availability is part of the solution of your simulation. And this, we have been implementing this recently, and I'm going to talk about the result today, which is going to be a major focus of my talk today. Um, so, but before I do that, I still want to give you a quick summary of what I, we have found using our old model result with a fixed sediment availability or Richardson number. Uh, we, we, at the Reynolds number 1,000, uh, we, we also try uh, different settling velocity, but the more, most important thing is that our simulation result actually revealed the existence of four different flow modes. Uh, for example, as we increase the sediment availability. For example, in the very dilute situation, we have uh, sediment concentration pretty much well mixed in the entire wave boundary layer, and the flow is more turbulent. And then uh, when we start to increase the sediment availability, we start to see the formation of luto climb, but the flow remains turbulent near the bed. And I'd like to see if I can show you an animation to illustrate this. So this is the part that I have to, because now I can only see this on my screen. But this morning, somebody has teach me a trick. Okay. Okay, so what you see here, the top panel is the snapshot of sediment concentration uh, under the wave. Uh, and and the, the top panel is the, the more turbulent mode one. And the top, bottom panel is the one that you actually see the formation of lutokine. And uh, let me play again. Uh, what you see here is that the, there are two isosurfaces of concentration I'm showing you here. The blue one is more dilute, and the, 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 the yellow one is more concentrated. As you can see, in the, in the first flow mode, 
uh, it is very turbulent throughout the entire water column, okay? But in the second flow mode, what you see here is that the top blue color is less turbulent compared with the first one. And this is associated with the location where we see the luteal climb. So meaning that in this case, you really have a two-layer system for a typical stratified flow. Uh, and the luteal climb really just um, uh, separates these two. And what's more impo important is that if you then further increase the sediment availability or the cell holding velocity, what you find is that the flow become almost not turbulent. Uh, if I can show you another animation here. What you see here is that the, um, now you see everything is much more calm. And uh, maybe during the flow reversal, we start to see some flow instabilities, but those instabilities never become mature turbulence. And in fact, if I further increase the sediment availability, I'm gonna have a completely lamorized bottom boundary layer. Okay, so, so the important thing is that uh, uh, we also uh, try to parameterize the, 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 this kind of boundary layer that we see. But I want to mention some of the important implications uh, uh, over this. That is the transition from flow mode one to flow mode two, when you increase the sediment concentration, this may imply the formation of wave-supported gravity flow that I mentioned in the beginning. And then, of course, as I mentioned, if you have the transition from the flow mode two to flow mode three and four, that is a lamorized bottom boundary layer, this may suggest the, large, the occurrence of a large wave dissipation or it could be suggesting the termination of the wave supported gravity flow. And therefore, we like, to pro we like to parameterize those processes. And at that time, we decided that it turns out the, the something called a carrying capacity concept, which was commonly used in the tidal boundary layer. Now we believe that we can actually use it in the wave boundary layer situation. Uh, but I'm gonna go back to this uh, in the next few slides. But the important thing right now is that what's gonna happen now if we allow sediment to get suspended from the bottom? Okay, and not prescribing it. And uh, so what, what we did was that we recently extended the code into a pseudo uh, hybrid spectrum compact, compact finite difference scheme. This will allow us to better incorporate variable viscosity and the La Nina bottom boundary condition. So in this case, with this La Nina bottom boundary condition, we can adopt this uh, continued erosion deposition formulation as a bottom boundary. So we use the erosion formula uh, provided by uh, Sanford and Marr, which the erosion is controlled by the critical shear stress and the empirical coefficient M, and the deposition is calculated by the cycle in flux. And then, um, and then at this point, I think it's actually very interesting to, 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 to show you, uh, based on this new boundary condition, what we're gonna expect to see. Okay, so the idea is this, you have a clear fluid uh, turbulent flow as an initial condition, and now you start to suspend sediment, of course. And what we know is that once the sediment is suspended in the water column, it's gonna damp the turbulence and reduce the bottom stress. This is called drag reduction. So the question is that as you suspend more sediment, you're gonna reduce the bottom stress more. The question becomes, at the final equilibrium, what is your reduced bottom stress? Okay, and if you look at this, you, 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 if you look at the wave average picture of these two formula, you said net erosion equals to deposition. You can do some calculation and you realize, realize that yes, the final equilibrium stress at the equilibrium shows that the, bottom, the, the equilibrium stress has to be reduced to alpha times the critical shear stress. So, so, so for example, and then of course, this, the, the total amount of sediment suspended will be proportional to the difference of the original clear fluid stress minus the final equilibrium stress. So the implication here is very, very, very clear. That is, let's say if you have a sediment bed that has a very small critical shear stress, you're gonna have a very small final equilibrium stress. Then of course you're gonna suspend much more sediment. Okay, so that's the idea. So, so what we're gonna see here is this. So we, we expect the resulting flow mode that we're gonna see now may be di dictated by the erodibility parameter, specifically the critical shear stress. Another thing is that, notice the settling velocity is also involved in this bottom erosion deposition, so it's also gonna depend on settling velocity. And finally, uh, this 
carrying capacity formulation that I mentioned before doesn't even involve critical shear stress. So we believe this parameterization has to be revised. So to test the, the, the effect of uh, critical shear stress, uh, we did uh, four different simulation with critical shear, shear stress ranging from very small value of 0.1 Pascal all the way to 0.6 Pascal. And, and if you look at the model result, you see that this is a time series of a domain average sediment concentration throughout the entire simulation. And you see that indeed, if you have a lower shear stress, critical shear stress, you're gonna suspend more sediment. Except for the case one, where we have the really small critical shear stress, initially you did suspend more sediment, but after maybe a few waves, the total suspended load is just dropping, okay? So clearly, cr lower critical shear stress gives larger suspended sediment load, but critical shear stress, when it is too small, the load reduces again. So wh why is that? Okay, so I'm gonna show you a few next few slides, why is that? So if now I'm plotting the, ISO, uh, the snapshot under the flow peak, the, uh, the, the left panel is the turbulent coherence structure uh, visualized by the CI, and the right panel shows the ISO surface of concentration. If you look at the, 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 the case with the lowest critical shear stress, what you see here is that there's almost no turbulence, and, and, the, and the concentration is just flat as a sheet. So essentially, we believe we see flow mode four. That is, when the critical shear stress is too low, it suspends too much sediment, then the turbulence is just completely killed. And then if you look at the other two cases with larger critical shear stress, we get start to see more and more turbulence coming out. And later I'm gonna show you that it turns out case two is associated to flow mode two and the case four is associated to flow mode one. So it's right here. So, so now I'm showing you the plan average sediment concentration profile, uh, streamwise velocity profile, and the uh, turbulent intensity uh, during the flow peak and during the flow reversal. And what you see here is that in case one, indeed, you have sediment accumulated very close to the bed. It, there's really no turbulence here, okay, in case one. And the wave boundary layer thickness is also much thinner. It's very close to the laminar solution. And then if you look at case two, you see that we see this nice, beautiful lutocline feature of suspended sediment. Uh, you do have much more turbulence throughout the water column and the wave boundary thickness is much thicker. And then in flow mode four, you see the sediment concentration is really well mixed throughout the entire water column. So the take home metrics right now is that indeed, we get to still see a diverse range of flow mode, but now by just simply changing the set, uh, erodibility of sediment. And as we know, we can never fully understand sediment transport without looking at the effect of settling velocity. So now I'm just, looking at, again, Reynolds number 1000, the same critical shear stress of 0.02 Pascal, but I'm running additional few cases with different settling velocity. With the case two that I showed you before, now we have settling velocity ranging from 0.17 millimeter per second all the way to 1.5 millimeter per second. And first, what you see here is that most cases we actually get flow mode two, but for the case with the smallest settling velocity, we again has a laminarized flow mode four. So apparently, when the settling velocity is also very small, you're gonna reduce the equilibrium stress, then you're gonna have more sediment suspended. Eventually, when it is too much, it's gonna laminarize the, the, the boundary layer. Another thing is that if you look at all the cases that's actually in regime, uh, flow mode two, you see that if you plot the total suspended load in the equilibrium as a function of settling velocity, we see that as long as if you are in flow mode two, it scales with the settling velocity of a one mi uh, minus 1.25 power. And if you go back to look at the standard carrying capacity concept, it suggests a minus one power. The way I see it, 1.25 is very close to one. So this may suggest that carrying capacity uh, probably works, still works, uh, if you, as long as you are in flow mode two. So this is very important for parameterization, so I want to look at this more carefully. So this is our old result using prescribed sediment availability. And at that time, uh, my student generated this nice flow map. Uh, basically, it's a function between settling velocity and the fixed Richardson number, and he got to see different flow mode. And now, of course, we're not prescribing Richardson number, but I can calculate the corresponding Richardson number or total suspended sediment in my domain in the equilibrium. 
And if I do that, and if I only show the result that's in flow mode one and flow mode two, this is my new result. As you can see, it still fits with this map, suggesting that as long as the flow is tur still turbulent in flow mode one and two, we can still use the carrying capacity to parameterize the total suspended load. So this is a good news. But what's missing right now is that we need an extra criteria to describe the onset of laminarization. Okay. And uh, so for that, we, I'd like to provide a final summary. That is, in, our, in the simulation I'm showing you today, obviously, it has to be dependent on critical shear stress. So, so if I plot all the different modes that we obtained as a function of a critical shear stress and the settling velocity, as you can see, as you have a lower critical shear stress or lower settling velocity, you tend to suspend more sediment, but then uh, you can then form a luto climb, but then you might comple completely laminarize the bottom boundary layer. And using this bottom erosion deposition formula, we can actually come up with the empirical relationship, and, uh, and then we can use our model result and fit this relationship to, uh, for this empirical coefficient k here, and we can actually provide two formula, which one is describing the transition from flow mode two to flow mode four, which is laminarize the criteria, and then another one is describing the transition from flow mode one to the formation of flow mode, uh, formation of a luteal client in the flow mode two. So in summary, uh, the erobility parameter is um, indeed uh, can dictate the transition of flow mode. Uh, and then uh, we show that the good news is that the suspended load can still be parameterized by the carrying capacity as long as the flow is still turbulent. And then we provide two empirical formulas that can describe the borders between flow mode one and flow mode two. Ongoing work, we really like to go back to simulate uh, wave supported gravity flow uh, and because we hypothesize, hypothesize that wave supported gravity driven mass flow can only exist in flow mode two. Okay, and finally, if you look at in the field, uh, you have you always have a small amount of sand contained in the mud. Could be as low as five percent, could be as big as uh, fifty percent. And and laboratory experiments have shown that if you just have a thirteen percent of sand in your sample of mud, uh, you see a very different picture. First of all, the sand can armor the mud. Okay, and this is another important contribution from Pat. Uh, many years ago that there, you have to use something called an active layer concept to describe this kind of a complicated processes. And laboratory experiment also show that when you have a surface layer of thick, very thin surface layer of sand, it actually can form ripples. So ripple can generate more turbulence. So making this whole problem much, much more complicated than I, what I was describing. And um, we are very eager to do more future study on this problem. Thank you. Thank you. Very impressive talk, Tom. Yes. So uh, the question I have is um, kind of related to the uh, cohesion of the, these particles in the rheology. Uh -huh. so how do you how do you treat that? Then the I saw from the equation you only use um, settling velocity and uh, Boltzmannistic uh, approximation. Right. So uh, for the first thing we have been starting to try is to change the viscosity of the problem. Because right now, we ignore the rheology you mentioned. Uh, but because with this new, uh, new uh, expansion of the code, we can now even use non-Newtonian uh, closure for the rheology. And then uh, we can actually start. We, we haven't, we, we, this is just still starting. We can start to actually look at the rheology uh, on, on this problem. But this is definitely a very important part that we haven't been really investigating very well. And, it, and for all this data, it's all diluted, so the um, Boussinex approximation can be used, or? Yeah, that Boussinex approximation, I think, is okay, because the largest concentration that we encounter typically is, is one, no more than, I mean, 100, 200 grams per liter, you already have a laminarized boundary layer. So we're not really looking at anything further than a few hundred grams per liter. And so if you look at the density difference, it's only, you know, 10, 20 percent. So I think it's still okay with, uh, in terms of using the Boussinger approximation. All right. Thank you. Thank you.